there's this question of developing consistent models across time, making sure your star formation is happening at the right points in time to line up with what we see. Um, so what's going on in that arena? Yeah, so part of this is a this is a observational challenge is that when you look at galaxies at different times, you want to try to compare apples and apples, not apples and oranges. And so you want to be looking at the same type of galaxy from one time to another. And so people come up with various ways of trying to figure out whether they're looking at the same type of galaxy at one time and another time. And then what you do is you go into big numerical calculations of galaxies and you try to test whether those ways that observers are doing it actually work in the computer simulation or figure out better ways. The, the puzzle is that you the, the, the galaxies that we see uh, when the universe was much younger don't produce enough light to produce reionization. And so there have to be much smaller galaxies that we're not yet seeing. And the way these new observations of the hydrogen itself will tell us is by telling us kind of the size of the bubbles of ionized gas created during reionization that tells us something about the type of galaxy that's producing reionization. Most of the mass that determines how galaxy formation happens is this dark matter stuff that we don't really know exactly what it is. And so the hard question is how much does our ignorance about the properties of dark matter affect galaxy formation. And so we, we usually proceed assuming dark matter has some very simple properties, try to figure out everything we can about galaxy formation with that assumption, and then only if, if we kind of really disagree with some observations, then sometimes people go and tweak the properties of dark matter and see can that make things consistent with observations or not. Um, but figuring out whether it's that your model of everything else about galaxy formation is what was wrong, or whether your model of dark matter is wrong, that's a real difficult challenge that people are really trying to figure out how to disentangle those two effects. One place that this comes in is that the calculations with just dark matter tell us that there should be uh, very large concentrations of dark matter at the centers of galaxies, at the centers of clusters, at the center of most uh, gravitationally bound objects. And at least in some cases, we don't really seem to see that observationally. And so one idea that people have suggested is that maybe dark matter doesn't just feel the force of gravity, it feels other forces in a way that smooths out how much dark matter there is at the centers of galaxies, so there isn't quite as much as you would otherwise think. Uh, but the other possibility is that the centers of galaxies is also where there's a lot of normal matter, stars and gas and stuff. And maybe Forming the stars and gas has a big effect on how much dark matter there is at the centers of galaxies. And so what we're trying to do is figure out which of those is really the right explanation for the fact that we don't see huge con we don't seem to see huge concentrations of dark matter in the central parts of galaxies. Is that because dark matter has more complicated properties than we thought, or is that because forming all the stars and gas at the center of the galaxy has affected how much dark matter is there. And I don't know the answer right now. This is what we're, you know, the community is trying to figure out. There's also these voids. And so why are people suddenly so interested in these voids that don't have galaxies in them? Yeah, so voids are these huge regions of space that essentially have no galaxies as far as we can see. So no big, bright galaxies. And so people... Uh, have been worried for a while that maybe these voids were so weird and so unusual in their properties that that actually was a signal that there was something different about dark matter than we thought. Or maybe it's just telling us something about how galaxies form that we didn't really understand. And so one way to go about this is to take the observations and try to really... Uh, pin down what really are the properties of these voids where there aren't that many galaxies, and then to compare that to the big numerical simulations that people have done. And so there were some interesting talks on how do you actually go about describing regions where there aren't anything, there are no galaxies. So how do you describe that quantitatively and then compare observations and simulations? There's one comment during the discussion at the end along the lines of, 
you actually believe the the, gal- the, the, the individual galaxy simulations that we currently have? Yeah. So that was a, that was a tough question. Uh, so that's the question. You know, if you if you simulate a galaxy like our own, do you believe in detail that you get the results right in the sense of comparison to what we see in our own galaxy? And I think the answer is kind of both yes and no. I think uh, at the at the kind of broadest levels, we can reproduce what we see in our own galaxy, but we get a lot of details wrong. And so the hope is that getting the kind of broad picture right is good enough for modeling galaxy formation, and that even if we don't get all the details right, maybe we'll still be okay. Um, but I don't think we actually know that that's the right answer. That's just kind of the hope, because if that isn't the case, then I think we're kind of hosed in our ability to make progress. For me, I think the area where there's the most likely to be a lot of observational and theoretical progress is really understanding this problem of how does gas get into galaxies and then how does it go back out again in these large outflows that we see from galaxies. And that kind of back and forth, in and out, is really one of the central problems in galaxy formation. And it's been a really hard one for a while, but the computer simulations are now getting good enough to model that. And the observations are providing a lot of new handles on how that happens. So I think, you know, over the next five years or so, that's going to be a really interesting area.